It's important to know who God is. It's also important to know who we are. We know that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent everywhere. We know that God is holy. We know that God is love. We know that God is merciful. We know that God is gracious. We know that God is good. And we know that God oversees the affairs of men. He indeed is sovereign. But not only is it important for us to know who God is, but in the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel, we have an important realization that comes to the king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. And if you have your Bibles, I would call your attention now to Daniel chapter 4. We've been speaking of daring faith, and we are focusing on the book of Daniel. And we have spoken about the standing that Daniel didn't defile himself with the king's meat, so that faith does not defile itself. We spoke of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and how they stood, how that faith stands. But isn't it good to know that faith never stands alone? For there in the fiery furnace, there was the form of the fourth, the Son of God. And we've spoken of the handwriting on the wall this morning and how that God is the Lord of history. But I'd like to talk to you this evening about this fourth chapter and a most unusual dream and fulfillment of the dream. Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. It seems that this chapter is actually being narrated by the king himself. But Nebuchadnezzar's testimony is here inserted into this book of the Old Testament. He says of God, How great are his signs! How mighty are his wonders! His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. If you have your Bibles with you this evening, I would like for you to read Daniel chapter 4 and verse 3, and I'd like for us to all read it together. Daniel 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 3, could we read it together? How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, I was flourishing in my palace, and I saw a dream which made me afraid. The thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me, and therefore I made a decree. I asked that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of my dream. And then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them, but they could not understand it, could not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But at last, a man named Daniel came in before me. His name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. Remember how that uh, Daniel's name was changed to Belteshazzar when he was moved to Babylon and to the court there? Of course, Daniel doesn't uh, take that name. He takes, stays with the name that was the name given to him in Jerusalem by his parents and that honored the living God. But he said, I, I called for Daniel to come in and I brought him in because he had the spirit of the holy gods and before him I told the dream. And I said, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubles thee. Tell me the visions of my dream that I've seen, and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of my head in my bed. 
I saw. And behold, there was a tree. This tree was in the middle of the earth, and the height thereof was very great. The tree grew, it was strong, and the height thereof seemed to reach all the way to the heavens, and the sight thereof to the end of the earth. The leaves of this great tree were fair, the fruit thereof was abundant, and there was enough for everyone. The beasts of the field had a shadow under it. The fowls of the heavens lived in the boughs of this tree, and all flesh was fed by this tree. And I saw in the vision of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He cried aloud, and he said, Cut down the tree, cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it, the fowls from its branches. Just leave the stump of his roots in the earth. Even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from a man's heart into a beast's heart, and let seven times pass over him. This matter, matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand of the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and he gives to whomsoever he will and he sets up over it the basest of men. These are most interesting facts. A dream, a tree, over the whole earth, suddenly in order to cut down the tree, and this interpretation from even Nebuchadnezzar, I want the living to know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men. This dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now, Belteshazzar or Daniel, could you tell me what it means? The wise men of my kingdom are unable to understand it. They can't make known to me the interpretation, but you're able, for the Spirit of the Holy God is in you. Then Daniel was astonished for one hour. His thoughts troubled him. The king said, Belshazzar, don't let the dream or the interpretation of the dream trouble you. Belteshazzar said, my, answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate you and the interpretation to your enemies. So he's, he's worried about giving the interpretation because all the enemies of Nebuchadnezzar were going to really be happy with what this dream means. I want you to know that there really was a Nebuchadnezzar. There really was a Babylon. There really was a king named Nebuchadnezzar. And what is going to be described here is confirmed, not as if we needed it to be confirmed by secular history, but it is confirmed by secular history. I, I think that's always great. For years, people didn't think there even was a Belshazzar. They thought this was all a made-up story. But history always confirms what the Scripture has taught. Listen, you don't ever have to be afraid to say, I believe the Word of God. I don't care if the scientists are pushing you one way, if the historians are pushing you another way, if the philosophers are telling you one thing, or perhaps some friend of yours is telling you that's not possible. Long after these people are gone, the word of the Lord will endure forever. 
And I am absolutely convinced, brothers and sisters, that if there's anything we need to cling to in this day, it's this word. Do not disregard it and do regard it. So this early did happen. And Daniel says, I'm a little worried about this dream interpretation because your enemies are going to really like what I've got to say here. But he said, here's what's going to happen. He said, the tree that you saw, verse 20, which grew and was strong, whose height reached to heaven and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much, in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. King, it's you. You are the one that have grown strong and become strong. Your greatness is grown and reaches to heaven. Your dominion goes to the ends of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree! Destroy it! Just leave a stump of the roots thereof in the earth. Wrap a band of iron and brass around it in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. King, this is what that means. This is the decree of the Most High. This is what God is going to do to you, O King. They will drive you from men. Your dwelling will be with the beasts of the field. And you will be eating grass like an ox. And you're going to be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven times will pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and He gives it to whosoever He wills. King, you're going to be the one that is driven out of this palace. And He literally will be taken out of the palace like a wild animal. And he lives in a pasture outside the city of Babylon. And he eats grass. And you just see him crawling around on all fours and you can see him just living the most unbelievable life. The king is now on all fours. And the dew of heaven soaks his back. But because they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, your kingdom will be sure to you after you know that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. Break off your sins by righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Look at what the king is commanded to do of God. He says, I want you to stop your sinning and I want you to show some mercy. You're so stuck up proud, self-sufficient, think you know it all, show some mercy! And maybe it will lengthen your tranquility. And verse 28, all this came upon the king of Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake, and he was 
he was just standing there. You see, how long did it? It's 12 months later. It's a year. It's a year since this dream has been told to him. And he's been thinking about it. It's in the back of his mind, but he's not acted on any of this. Obviously, he did not break off his sins. Obviously, he did not humble himself. Obviously, he didn't show mercy to the poor. Because he's sitting there in his palace. Verse 31 says, and uh, 31 says, that he was looking around and he says is not this great Babylon that I have built you can see him standing on the top of one of the the, the roofs of his great palace that overlooks the ancient city he said I have built this house of the kingdom by the might of my power and I have done it for my majesty he probably sang a verse of that song, How great I am, how great I am. And when he got to the end of it, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from you. And they'll drive you from men, and your dwelling will be at the beasts of the field. And they'll make you to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until you know that the Most High ruleth are the kingdoms of men, and gives it to who he wills. And the same hour was this thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. Artists have tried to depict what a scene it must have been as this once powerful regal authority, this man who had the greatest kingdom of the ancient world, now finds his reason gone from him and in the insanity of his own folly he now begins to descend to the life of a beast. They drive him out of the town and he finds himself in a pasture eating grass with the oxen. His body is wet with the dew of heaven. His hairs grew like eagle's feathers. And his nails grew like bird's claws. I think that happened. I think that's exactly what happened. I believe it's exactly the sentence that God issued for this proud monarch. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. Where did he look to? Heaven. He no longer was looking over the majesty of his vast kingdom, but now he was looking to heaven. Our sovereign God consults no one in respect to what shall be done by him. He rules by his own infinite knowledge. He asks no one what to do or how to do it. He consults only himself. He asks only his own infinite intelligence. He is not arbitrary. I want you to understand something. The affairs of human history are not the result of arbitrary thinking in the mind of God. He is not arbitrary. He is not unreasonable. But everything that he does is governed by infinite reason. 
infinite love and infinite holiness. His knowledge is perfect. His knowledge is infinite. And you can be sure that when God rules, he rules right. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar didn't get the warning signs of a proud heart. I read a list of the warning signs of a proud heart, and I have no idea who came up with the list, but it sure looks good to me. A proud heart thinks he's right. A proud heart is easily offended. A proud heart does not like to be corrected. A proud heart complains about circumstances or people. A proud heart is an ungrateful heart. A proud heart is impatient with others and sometimes even impatient with God. A proud heart likes to talk more than to listen. A proud heart desires to be first. A proud heart desires to be the best. A proud heart desires to be noticed. A proud heart is obstinate toward authority. A proud heart is quick to find fault with others. A proud heart is bold to contradict. A proud heart is demanding, hard to please. A proud heart is much more sensitive to personal desires than to the needs of others. A proud heart boasts about achievements. A proud heart lives beyond his means. A proud heart has a hard time forgiving others. It's pride that makes people liars, hypocrites, men-pleasers, and contentious. Do you see yourself in that list? Pride is self-satisfaction. Pride is self-sufficiency. Pride is self-reliance. Pride considers itself above instruction. Pride is insubordinate. Pride takes credit for what God has done. Pride puts blame on God for what man has done. Pride exalts in being made much of. Pride aspires to the place of God and opposes the existence of God. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, do you not see that it is your pride that refused to trust in God, your arrogance, your pride, was so distasteful and disgusting and displeasing to the living God that there was no other remedy than to drive you from your palace to the field where you could eat grass, and grow long nails and hair that looks like eagle's wing feathers. Wesley said, all pride is idolatry. And someone has said, at its root, all sin can be traced to pride. I want you to know, Christians, we can take this and we can point out the pride in our country we can point out the pride in our politicians. We can point out the pride in our civic leaders. We can point out the pride in our culture. 
But we sure would do well this evening to measure ourselves by the Word of God and ask the Lord, how's my heart? Am I proud? Am I refusing to trust in God? Am I so anxious about the future? Am I humble enough to be carefree? That's a good question. Am I humble enough to be carefree? Humble enough to know that the God who rules and reigns is still on his throne. And he will work all things together for good to them who love him. Praise God. So we see what happens as he lifts up his head with pride. The Lord takes him, drives him from his kingdom. But at the end of days, he testifies in verse 34, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. I finally got my eyes off of how great I am onto the majesty and the glory and the power and the might of the God who is in heaven. And when I put my mind and my heart toward heaven, my reason returned, and God's will and God's word were fulfilled. I blessed the Most High. I praised and honored him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Brothers and sisters, the God of Daniel is the God that we worship today. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Men may rule, but God overrules. Our Supreme Court may make the most insane, godless rulings in their dark robes and majesty, but there will come a day when the God who is an everlasting dominion, whose kingdom is from generation to generation, will be honored. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Hallelujah. And all the inhabitants of the earth, verse 35, Nebuchadnezzar testifying, why, they're nothing. Because God doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. Isn't that a great verse? God doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can stop him. Wow. He cannot be stopped. And no one can say to God, What are you thinking? I got a confession to make. I've asked him that a few times. Lord, what are you thinking? But I came to realize it wasn't God's thinking that was at fault. It was Rick's. I was the one that needed to pause. At the same time, he said, my reason returned to me. And when his reason returned, the glory of his kingdom, he regained his honor he regained his brightness, and his counselors and his lords came back to him. And he was established in his kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. In verse 37 he testifies, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol 
and honor the King of Heaven. All of His works are truth. All of His ways are judgment. And then this most awesome tagline. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. If you've walked with the Lord for very long, the Lord has no doubt opened your eyes at least on a few occasions to this reality of this pride that's within you. And sometimes the Lord has to use rather drastic means to catch our attention. He sure has in my life. But how grateful I am that there came a day when I looked up to heaven. And I realized God is still God when the waves roll high. God is still good all through the night when I've done all I can and I don't even understand. God is still good. Clouds of doubt may darken my way, but showers of blessing will come any day. He will see us through, and we can stand and say, God is still good. When you think your problem is so great you cannot solve it, you're right. You can't. But that's when God can. When you realize you can't, that's when God can. God is greater. Why don't I think God is greater? Why don't I think God can solve this? Why am I so anxious? Why am I so fretful? Why am I so fearful? Why am I so doubting? Why am I so hesitant? Well, it could be I'm just too proud, too stinking proud to recognize God is in charge here. Not Rick. Not you. God.